Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. For this lecture, we're going to cover chapters 5 and 6. So in chapter 3, we looked at the goods market, and in chapter 4, we looked at the financial markets. In chapter 5, we will look at the goods market and the financial market together. And by the end, you will have an ISLM framework to think about how output and interest rates are determined in the short term. In Chapter 6, we will look at the distinction between nominal and real interest rates, the notion of risk, the role of financial intermediaries, and incorporate these into our ISLM model. So, let's begin. Now suppose that you're considering opening a lemonade stand. The stand will require a large amount of money up front to purchase a physical structure, print signs, and procure the necessary ingredients. You will need to borrow money for these purchases. So, would a relatively high or low interest rate on the loan make you more likely to invest? Well, the goal of any business is to maximize profits. One way of doing that is to lower costs. Higher interest payments on loans increases these costs and therefore a relatively low interest or a relatively low interest rate should make you more likely to invest. Now suppose that you have enough cash to make the investments to set up your own stand. Would the interest rate really matter for your decision to invest? Hmm, not really. Why? The interest rate only really matters for your decision to invest if you are borrowing. Since you are not borrowing here, the interest rate doesn't really matter for your decision. Now, based upon the previous example, through what channel do you think monetary policy affects the economy? Well, monetary policy affects the economy through interest rates. If the Fed causes the interest rates to increase, then borrowing or investment is discouraged. If the Fed causes the interest rates to decrease, then borrowing or investment is encouraged. Now think, if interest rates on bonds were negative, would you hold bonds or hold money? If interest rates on bonds were negative, then there is no point in holding bonds. Instead of receiving interest payments, you would have to pay interest to hold bonds since interest rates are negative. At this point, it makes more sense to hold money instead of holding bonds. In the earlier lectures, we held assumptions of investment either being fixed or depending upon output. But the question is, does investment only depend on income? We will see that in a few slides. By relaxing these, this assumption, we build the investment saving relationship, which we will link with the liquidity preference and money supply later. As we discussed a little bit in the first question slide, interest rate is an important determinant of borrowing and hence investment. When interest rate increases, investment is likely to fall because borrowing is discouraged. Similarly, when interest rate decreases, investment falls because it is cheaper to borrow, meaning that nominal interest rate I and investment are negatively related, represented by the negative sign here. Again, when firms have higher sales, they need to increase output, and to increase output, they need to invest more. Therefore, output and investment have a positive relationship represented by the positive sign here. Now that we know that investment is also determined by interest rate, we will incorporate that into our model and use it to determine output. Recall from Chapter 3 that the equilibrium in the goods market is characterized as production Y equals to the demand for goods Z. And this demand or output is equals C plus I plus G. The main simplification of that model was to assume that the interest rate did not affect demand for goods. In this chapter, we, we abandon that simplification and introduce I or interest rate in our model. Here, the equilibrium output or demand for goods is still C plus I plus G, but investment here depends not only on output but also on the interest rate. 
this term here means that consumption depends on y minus t which is disposable income and your government spending is still fixed this is also called the is relation because it can be found by setting total savings equal to total investment total savings is public savings plus private savings so this is private savings which is y minus that is your income minus taxes minus consumption and t minus g which is your public savings taxes minus government spending equals investment and if we simplify this equation we get again y equals c plus i plus g hence this is your is relationship in which y is equal c which depends on disposable income plus investment which depends on output and interest rates plus your fixed level of government spending. Now let's look at how we can graphically derive the IS curve or the investment savings curve. We can graphically derive the IS curve by varying the interest rate. The IS curve basically maps out the relationship between interest rate and output. However, interest rate affects output through demand. So when the interest rate increases, this causes the demand for goods to shift down. Now let's go back to the demand and output relationship we studied in the goods market shown by the first graph where ZZ is the demand curve. Assume that we're initially at point A. And at point A, your equilibrium output is Y and your equilibrium interest rate is I. The interest rate increases, which lowers aggregate demand and shifts the ZZ curve downwards. The new equilibrium is at point A prime. This can be shown by the reduction in output in both of these graphs. We're basically mapping out this reduction in output in both of these graphs. But at point A prime here, your interest rate is higher. And thus, we have just derived the negative relationship between interest rate and output to get the downward sloping IS curve. So the IS curve basically maps out the negative relationship between interest rate and output. As interest rate increased in the goods market here, output fell from Y to Y prime. Now that we are done with deriving the IS curve, we want to know when this IS curve shifts. Before we do that, we need to consider the differences between movement along the IS curve and shifts in the IS curve. A movement along the IS curve will be due to changes in endogenous variables, output and interest only. Just like in the demand supply model, when there are movements along the curve due to price and quantity only. Shifts in the IS curve occur due to changes in exogenous variables such as autonomous consumption, investment, taxes, or government spending. This graph shows a shift in the IS curve following an increase in taxes. As taxes are increased, aggregate demand falls and the IS curve shifts to the left with the new equilibrium. At this point, output is lower at Y prime and interest rate is still at I. Now that we have our IS curve from the goods market, which is like a demand curve, we move on to the financial markets to derive a supply-like curve. Now recall from the financial markets discussion in Chapter 4 that the equilibrium for the supply and demand for money is given by money stock equals P times Y times 
L, which is your liquidity preference, which depends on Y and interest rate. Here we think of the central bank directly controlling this money stock. P times Y here denotes nominal GDP, which is real GDP, Y, times the GDP deflator, P. We can rewrite this money demand equation in such a way that we get it in terms of real money balance. M is the money stock and M over P is the real money balance, which is equals to Y times the liquidity preference. Therefore, real money demand is determined by real income and interest rates. Now, what is real money demand as opposed to nominal money demand? Suppose you eat a calzone for lunch every day that costs $8. So you would want to have exactly $8 in your pocket to buy the calzone. This $8 is your nominal money demand. Equivalently, you would want to have enough money to buy a calzone. This is your demand for money in terms of the calzone. So you're only focusing on the, on the calzone and you want to have enough money to buy the calzone. This is your real money demand, which is in terms of the good that you are willing to purchase. Now let's derive the LM relation graphically using what we know about financial markets. In the past, the LM relation would have been portrayed as an upward sloping curve because before, the central bank used to set the money supply and the interest rate would just adjust. However, that does not re reflect the reality of how modern central banks operate now. They generally set the interest rate targets for two to three months and then adjust the money supply to reach the target. Now, because the central bank sets the interest rate or sets the interest rate target, the LM curve is represented by a horizontal line. As we learned in the last chapter, chapter 4 from financial markets, the choice of interest rate can be approximated by the Taylor rule for most central banks. In the graph, a movement along the LM curve will only change output but won't change interest rates. The interest rate changes only when the LM curve shifts. This LM curve is the supply-like curve in this model. We bring together these two relations, the IS relation and the LM relation involving output and interest rate to get the ISLM model. The IS relation is represented by this equation as we saw, and the LM relation is represented by I equals I bar because the interest rate is fixed as the central bank sets targets for the interest rate. The equilibrium is where these two curves intersect and pins down the equilibrium output and interest rates. In this ISLM model, we combine the equilibrium in the goods market and the equilibrium in the financial market. The interaction of these IS and LM curves graphically determine the equilibrium output and the equilibrium interest rate. Now let's look at a practical example. Suppose the government decides that it needs to reduce the budget deficit by raising taxes and keeping government spending levels unchanged. This is called fiscal contraction and increasing the deficit by reducing taxes would be called fiscal expansion. Now, what are the effects of the change in taxes? We can work through this by going through the shift in IS curve. In the graph, we are at equilibrium at point A initially. If taxes are raised, the IS curve shifts to the left and achieves a new equilibrium at point A prime. This point A prime corresponds to a new output level, which is a lower output at Y prime. 
But notice how the interest rate remains the same at I bar. Why is that? That is because the central bank in this case is setting interest rate targets. So no matter how much the ice curve shifts to the left and output decreases, the interest rate is fixed at I bar. Now let's quickly work through the logic of this figure. The ice curve shifts to the left because for any given interest rate, the aggregate demand has shifted to the left meaning that the equilibrium output is lower for any given interest rate. Why? Since households now have less disposable income, they decrease consumption, which leads to a decrease in aggregate demand for goods and services. This leads to a decrease in output and income. As we also saw that the LM curve remains unchanged. Interest rate is the same because of the Fed's interest rate target. However, income has decreased. So we need to understand how interest rate is maintained at I bar. Income has decreased. This decreases the demand for money. If the central bank did nothing, this would cause the interest rate to decrease. But the central bank wants to maintain that interest rate at I bar. So to maintain its interest rate target, the central bank will decrease the money supply so that interest rate is maintained at I bar. Therefore, with the shift of the IS curve to the left and the central bank maintaining the same interest rate, we will have a new equilibrium with a lower output but the same interest rate. We could also walk through the effects of a change numerically. Notice that these three equations would give you the equations required for an IS curve. And this is the equation required for a LM curve. Using these equations, we can numerically solve for the equilibrium values of the variables in the model. We will also assume a case when the Congress decides to increase government spending by $200. We can insert all the equations into y equals c plus i plus g and get this initial equilibrium in terms of interest rate i. And then further simplify it in this form. And then finally insert i equals 0.05 or 5% into the equation to get output equals 2650. Now, if government spending in, is increased by $200, then now your government spending is 300 plus 200 equals 500. The new equilibrium can now be written as this equation. Please do it in your own notebooks. It can then be further simplified to get this equation. And then finally inserting interest rate, which is equals 0.05 or 5% in our model gives us y equals 3650 compared to 2650 before. As you can see, a $200 increase in government spending increases output or Y by $1,000. So we see a multiplier at work here. This is the same multiplier from the simple goods market model. If the central bank had not acted to keep a constant interest rate, the multiplier would have been smaller. In the last few slides, we saw how fiscal policy affects the ISLM model. Now we will look at how monetary policy affects the ISLM model. Recall that the two instruments required for monetary policy are money supply and interest rates. An increase in the money supply corresponds to a decrease in the interest rate. This is why a decrease in the interest rate is called a monetary expansion. On the other hand, a decrease in the money supply corresponds to an increase in the interest rate. 
This is why an increase in the interest rate is known as a monetary contraction. Now suppose the situation where the Fed believes that a recession is coming. Recall that during a recession, aggregate demand is low and output is low. In order to increase the aggregate demand during the recession, the Fed reduces the nominal interest rate. This is a monetary expansion. They do this by increasing money supply through open market purchases of bonds. Which curve does this affect? Does this affect the IS curve or the LM curve? Well, this directly impacts the LM curve. Now, what happens in the money market as a result of the monetary expansion? What does this mean for the LM curve? We will see all that in the graph in the next slide. Now, let's look at this graph. We're at point A initially, where the LM curve and the IS curve are intersecting. At this point, we have equilibrium output equals Y and equilibrium interest rate equals I bar. As a result of the increase in money supply, the interest rate falls, which is represented by a downward shift of the LM curve. This changes the equilibrium from A to A prime and leads to an increase in output from Y to Y prime. Thus, as we can see, that the monetary policy of reducing the interest rates is able to curb the effects of recession and increase output. This is how monetary policy can be used to reduce the effects of recession and stimulate the economy and increase the output. In the last few slides, we showed the impact of fiscal and monetary policies working separately. However, in reality, the monetary authority is working at the same time as the fiscal policy makers, so there is always a policy mix. Sometimes both policies can be expansionary or contractionary. This might happen in a deep recession where fiscal and monetary policy on its own may not be able to get the unemployment back on its natural level. So in that case, the monetary authority and fiscal policy makers would both um, implement an expansionary policy, an expansionary fiscal policy and an expansionary monetary policy. In other times, one policy can be expansionary and the other can be contractionary. For example, in the 1990s, when President Clinton cut spending and raised taxes to reduce the budget deficit. This was an example of contractionary fiscal policy. At the same time, the Federal Reserve engaged in expansionary monetary policy to accommodate the contractionary fiscal policy implemented by the government and to avoid a recession caused by the reduced aggregate demand. Till now, we have seen that a change in IS curve or a change in LM curve or a change in interest rates are happening instantaneously, right when the government or the Fed are implementing it. However, this is not so in the real world. In the real world, the following things happen with a lag. For example, consumers are li likely to take some time to respond to a change in disposable income. Again. Firms are likely to take some time to adjust their investment due to a change in their sales. In our graphs, we have shown that investment, that firms change investment instantaneously following a change in interest rates. But firms are likely to take some time to adjust their investment following a change to the interest rate. And finally, firms are likely to take some time to adjust their production following a change in their sales. Now let's look at impulse response functions following a 1% reduction in the federal funds rate. These little graphs here are called impulse response functions. 
These impulse response functions can be generated very easily using software like eViews. Recall that the federal funds rate is the rate at which banks lend to each other. An impulse response function shows the evolution of one variable following a change in another variable. Here, we are looking at the impulse response functions of a 1% reduction in the federal funds rate and its impact on variables like retail sales, output, employment, unemployment, and the price level. So, a decrease in the federal funds rate is supposed to increase output and increase employment. And it does. However, that happens with a lag. Following a decrease in the federal funds rate, say at this point, it takes eight quarters for output to increase. So it takes eight, uh, eight quarters for output to actually start increasing. And it doesn't happen as instantaneously as our theories would explain. And the same goes for all of these variables here. The increase in employment actually starts much later than when that reduction in the federal funds rate and the federal funds rate is enacted. So now we are going to start chapter 6. Till now we have assumed that we have two financial assets in our model money and bonds, and one interest rate, the rate of bonds, determined by monetary policy. But the financial system is more complex. Here, we look at the distinction between nominal and real interest rates, the notion of risk in the financial market, the role of financial intermediaries, and we incorporate these into our ISLM model. Your nominal interest rate is the return on an asset in terms of current dollars. On the other hand, your real interest rate is the return on an asset that accounts for real purchasing power of the money earned. Now, interest rates are set even before inflation occurs. So they are set based on the predicted inflation rate or the expected inflation rate. Suppose you borrow $10,000 this year to purchase one new car. This is a very shady lender, so the de they demand that you pay it back in full in one year plus 5% interest rate. But how much will you have to repay? You have to repay $10,500. $10,000 $10, is the principal amount and $500 is the interest on that loan. Now suppose that the prices are expected to go up by 2%. So the car is expected to cost $10,200. So the real return that the lender received from you is less than 5% because of inflation. Now let's look at how we can explain the relationship between prices this year, nominal interest rate, expected inflation rate, and real interest rate using theory. Suppose you borrow PT dollars this year to buy a loaf of bread. Just an example. So next year, you have to return the principal amount plus the interest, which is equal to 1 plus your nominal interest rate plus the amount that you borrowed, PT dollars. But you also want to know how many breads you can buy with that money with the future price level in real terms which is equal to 1 plus nominal interest rate times price, which is the same thing as this, divided by the expected price in the future. Therefore, it follows that the one-year real interest rate, RT, can be explained using this equation, where RT is the real interest rate, 1 plus RT is equal to 1 plus your nominal interest rate times the price divided by the expected price in the future, 
to account for the change in inflation rate or change in price due to inflation rate. The equation in the last slide can be rewritten to get the exact Fisher equation in this slide, which shows the relationship between the real interest rate, the nominal interest rate, and the expected inflation rate in the future or for the future. Following this equation, we can also find out the approximate Fisher equation, which tells us that the real interest rate is approximately equals your nominal interest rate minus your expected inflation rate. When your expected inflation is equal to zero, your real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate. But that is usually not the case. Usually, your inflation rate is positive and your nominal interest rate is greater than your real interest rate. You need to know this formula to solve a few equations, solve a few problems in this course. So remember that you need to know this formula and how changes in inflation rate or nominal interest rate would affect real interest rate. This graph here shows the evolution of nominal interest rate and real interest rates over time between 1978 and 2014. As you can see, the nominal interest rate is usually always greater than the real interest rate, which means this portion here is your inflation rate. If you look at the financial market, you will see that the riskier or more volatile assets pay higher interest to induce people to invest in them. If the risky and the risk-free assets or bonds paid the same interest, then no one would actually have invested in the risky asset. So the added interest paid on a risky asset above a risk-free asset is called the risk premium. Different factors influence the size of the risk premium. The probability of default affects the interest paid on debt or risk premium. This is something you probably saw in your real life as well. People with lower credit scores or people who are more likely to default usually pay higher interest on loans or unpaid credit card bills. The degree of risk aversion or the degree to which someone dislikes, dislikes risk among savers also determines the risk premium. When savers are more, more risk averse, that is, they dislike risk, those people demand a higher risk premium. Now let's theorize the level of risk premium at which risk neutral investors are indifferent between the risk free and the risky assets. Suppose that the risk free interest rate is I. That is, if you invest in a risk free asset, the interest that you get is I. Lenders are risk neutral, meaning that they are indifferent between risk free and risk -free, risky assets. If they choose the risky asset, there is a probability rho of default and the risk premium for the risky asset is x. This means that with probability 1 minus rho, the lender will receive a gross interest rate of 1 plus your interest rate plus the risk premium. This is for the risky asset. And since this is a risky asset, there is always a probability rho that the lender receives a gross interest rate of zero. So risky assets, either they give you a gross interest rate of zero or they give you an interest rate of one plus the nominal interest rate plus the risk premium. Arbitrage tells us that the risk neutral investors should be indifferent between the risk free bond and the expected return on the risky asset. So your return from the risk-free bond is 1 plus i, and this term here tells you the expected return on the risky asset, which is the probability times the return if there's no default plus the probability 
times the return if there is a default and your return is zero. Solving this equation for x, we get x equals this, equa this equation, rho times 1 plus i divided by 1 minus rho. Remember this equation because we might have a few problems that use this equation. Now let's look at a few ratios that financial intermediaries calculate to determine the health of their institutions. First, capital ratio, which is the ratio of the capital of a bank to its assets. Second is the leverage ratio, which is the ratio of the assets to a bank's capital. This is basically the inverse of the capital ratio. So far, we've modeled the financial sector as being involved in direct finance. The reality is that financial intermediaries are involved in a lot of borrowing and lending between each other. Greater leverage or higher assets to capital ratio increases the rate of profit for the bank, but it also increases their risk. Greater leverage means that higher investment in different types of assets like bonds. Higher investment in these different types of assets increases risk. Now let's look at an example. Suppose the bank from the previous slide earns 5% on its assets of $100 and pays 4% on its liabilities of $80. Then their profit will be 100 times 5%, which is what they receive, minus 80 times 4%, which is what they pay on their liabilities. This is equals 1.8 of return or profit on whatever activities of the bank that they have. Therefore, the return on its capital, which is 1.8, the profit, divided by the amount of capital that they have, $20. This is equals 9%. Now again, suppose that the bank owners decide to put up only $10 in capital and finance the rest with liabilities. So now their level of assets is $100 and their level of liabilities is $90 and the level of capital that they have is $10. Therefore, their profits are now 100 times 5% return minus 90 times 4%. So their new profit is 1.4. So their return on capital now is 1.4, their profit divided by 10, which is the capital, equals 14%. So following a decrease in the level of capital and increase in the level of liabilities, their leverage ratio went from 5 to 10, while their rate of profit went from 9 to 14%. Notice that increasing liabilities to $90 increase their returns to 14%, but this also increases the level of risk associated. What if instead some of the bank loans turn out to be bad, so the, so the value of their asset decreases from 100 to 90? This decreases bank capital to $10 and increases leverage from 5 to 9 only. The bank could call in some of its loans. Most loans are callable, that is, if the bank asks for it, people have to return the money as soon as possible. For example, it calls in 40 in loans, $40 in loans, and uses the proceeds to pay down $40 in liabilities. This would lower their leverage ratio back down to $5. We're going to see a lot of these examples in homework or in our exam. So make sure that you understand this. Now we will assume that in making investment decisions, firms care about the real cost of borrowing 
R plus X, which is your real interest rate plus the risk premium. And hence, we will extend the ISLM model to include this aspect of the real cost of borrowing. As a result, we, mo we model the LM relationship as R equals R bar. In contrast to what we had before, we had the nominal interest rate equals I bar. So now we are including the real interest rate plus we are saying that investment decisions in the IS relation depend on R plus X which is your real cost of your real cost of borrowing here r bar is equals i bar minus your expected inflation rate after extending the islm model with the real cost of borrowing we're going to look at the effect of an increase in risk premium on this model the central bank chooses the real policy rate r but the real interest rate relevant for spending decisions is the borrowing rate, which is R plus X, which also depends on the risk premium X. An increase in risk premium could be because of many reasons. Maybe inv investors are now more risk averse and want a higher risk premium. Maybe financial institutions are bankrupt and investors are worried. Hence, they're forcing other banks to reduce lending. So let's look at the graph now. Imagine that we are at point A initially, where your IS and LM curves intersect with output Y and real interest rate R bar. An increase in risk premium X decreases investment spending and shifts the IS curve to the left and decreases the equilibrium output to Y prime at the same interest rate R bar. Therefore, the effect of an increase in risk premium is decrease in output from Y to Y prime at the same interest real interest rate R bar. An increase in X or the risk premium may not be entirely exogenous to the model. A big enough drop in output is likely to cause an increase in the probability of default as well. What can policymakers do in the face of a massive recession and spike in risk premium? In normal situation, they could increase money supply to lower interest rates and this would ease off recession and increase output. What if the economy is in a liquidity trap at interest rate equals zero? At that point, their ability to respond will be hindered by a zero lower bound on nominal interest rates. Now let's go back to the same example we saw before. Initially, we're at point A here, which is our equilibrium where the LM and IS curves intersect. As X increases or as risk premium increases, the borrowing rate R plus X increases, leading to a decrease in demand and a shift in the IS curve to the left. This causes output to decrease as well. Problems in the financial system lead to a recession. That is, a financial crisis becomes a macroeconomic crisis as output falls. In such a situation, what can policy do to curb the effects of recession? They can either increase government spending or decrease taxes to increase output, but that may lead to a budget deficit. So fiscal policy cannot be used here. Given that the cause of low output is that interest rates facing borrowers is too high because of high risk premium, Monetary policy would be a better tool to handle this. Now, R plus X is the real cost of borrowing. Since the X is high, the central bank must decrease R so as to keep R plus X unchanged because spending decisions solely depend on R plus X and not R solely. And hence, the central bank causes R to fall. <laughs> 
But how does that happen? Let's look at this example. Suppose in the initial equilibrium, R was equals 2% and X was equals 1%. Suppose that now your X or your risk premium increases by 4%, so from 1% to 5%. To maintain the same value of R plus X, which is 3%, the central bank must decrease the policy rate from 2% to minus 2%. Given the zero lower bound on the nominal rate, the lowest real rate that the central bank can achieve is given by R equals I minus expected inflation. And at the zero lower bound, where, where we are in a liquidity trap, your nominal interest rate is equal to zero. So your real interest rate actually depends on the negative of your expected inflation rate. Therefore, High, ex high expected inflation rate would help to lower the real interest rate and low inflation expectations would not lower real interest rate enough to stimulate the economy. Therefore, as central bank decreases R so as to keep R plus X unchanged, the LM curve shifts downward. And now the new IS curve intersects with the new LM curve to maintain output at the initial level. And hence we can eliminate the effects of a recession or falling output. In the lead up to the most recent financial crisis, housing prices began to fall. Because banks were over leveraged and there was a complex network of debt due to securitization, the entire financial sector was at risk, in addition to increasing the risk premium for borrowers. The Federal Reserve, or the Central Bank of the US, cut their nominal policy rate to zero. However, this coupled with low inflation expectations led to a real interest rate that was too high to prevent a major recession. This graph here shows the impact of the Great Recession using the extended ISLM model. During the Great Recession, the IS curve shifted greatly to the left to IS prime from equilibrium point A to equilibrium point B. The Fed and the government used monetary and fiscal policies simultaneously to curb the effects of this recession. An increase in government spending shifted the IS curve, curve from IS prime to IS double prime in order to stimulate aggregate demand and increase output. The Fed lowered the interest rate to zero to increase output, thus shifting the LM curve downwards. And to a certain extent, output did increase, and it increased till Y prime. However, due to low inflation expectations, the real interest rate was too high to prevent the Great Recession. If inflation expectations were high enough, then the real interest rate would have fallen much more. And at this level, output would have reached the level that it was before the recession to Y. And if that happened, the Great Recession could have been prevented altogether. However, that was not the case. Due to low inflation ex expectations, output could not be increased to the previous level at Y. We are done with this lecture for today. Please let me know if you have questions. You can either email me or come during office hours on Tuesday and Thursday. Thank you.